Now, time to pick up where we left off. I hope you didn't miss your lecture on Thursday too much. But last Tuesday, we introduced the broad topic of time and space, which I hope left a lot of you scratching your heads, because this stuff is not um, immediately intuitive or immediately obvious, and there are lots and lots of perplexities that we encounter when we start to think about the nature of time and our relationship to it, and the nature of space. And perhaps one of the most disconcerting things that you can recognize of your own experience is that we like to think of ourselves as distinct from the world and the world as simply being there. That's a useful way to conduct our business. But the world is not simply there. The world appears to us as it does because we have a particular shape and size and because we are embedded in time in a particular way. So there Things that appear to you to be big are big only because you have a determinate form, a determinate size. Things that appear to you to be small, likewise, are not in themselves small. They're small with respect to you. So you interpret the world from this spatial reference. So a paramecium or an ant experiences a very, would experience a very, very different world. But the same is also true of time, and this is even harder for us to recognize in our own experience, that we encounter the world through the medium of our body, which has processes going on, physiological processes that dictate what appears to us to be fast and slow. Fast and slow play the role in the temporal dimension that big and small play in the spatial arena. We see things as fast or slow, because we live at a particular time scale, and we can become aware of events at different time scales through the magic of time-lapse photography and high-speed photography. As if that wasn't perplexing enough, then we noted that our concept of time is complex. <laughs> we often think of time as simply extending from very far in the past to very far in the future, but that notion of time has no concept of the present in it. And our concept of the present suggests that the instant that we're living now is infinitesimally small. It's the never-changing point at which the future rushes into the past. And we understand the future and the past as very different things. So this notion of now and the present is extremely important to us. But that notion of time that refers to a present is not easy to square, or has never been squared, with the notion of time as simply a linear sequence from very far in the past to very far in the future. Psychologists have made a half-assed attempt to improve on this with this notion of the psychological present, which suggests that your experience of the present is in fact assembled through the good agencies of your senses. It's a constructed and it lies within a time window of about, well, no one's ever been able to put a precise figure on it, one and a half to two seconds. But that's a, 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 an unsatisfying story that leaves most of the mystery untouched. Coming back down to Earth, because we had a lot of challenging concepts already. My God, that was a hell of a, hell of a lecture last Tuesday. Sorry about that. But we then started thinking, well, if time is so complex and it's wrecking our heads so much, don't worry wreck the heads of the brightest people who've ever lived. So we're in good company. Um, but we were looking at some more grounded work, which looked at how do people think about this confusing thing. And we saw the work of Lyra Boroditsky in particular, where she argues that people adopt at least two different frames of reference when they're thinking about time. The ego-moving perspective, in which you see yourself progressing into the future and the time-moving perspective from which you are your fix, our fixed reference point and the future is coming towards you. And these frames were disambiguated using the question, your Wednesday meeting has been moved forward two days, which day is it on? We saw that this question, when posed to people at different points in the lunch queue at Stanford University, produced different answers depending on where people were in the queue. As they just join the queue and they're kind of stuck with the prospect of 10 minutes standing in line, then the time moving or couch potato perspective seemed to predominate. The closer they got to the front of the queue and the closer they were to being released from this 
horrible state of waiting for your sandwich, the more the ego-moving perspective took over. So that was interesting. We looked at a few more things, but I think that was quite a lot. And that's where we're going to pick up the story today with consideration of rhythms and cycles. And initially, I'm going to use the words rhythm and cycle loosely for anything that repeats. We'll come back to maybe a slightly more nuanced version of the word rhythm in a minute. And there's a basic distinction we need to make, which is between processes that go on inside your body and processes that go on in the rest of the world. We have different words for these. Exogenous processes are outside you. Endogenous processes are inside you. Now there are cyclical processes in the world, exogenous processes, that you're very familiar with. The passage of night and day, the passage of the seasons, the orbit of the moon around the earth. These are some of the cycles that we'll be attending to today. But there are also processes inside the body that have their characteristic time periods as well. And what we see is that we are hooked into the world because these endogenous processes interact with the exogenous processes through a process that we've met before known as entrainment. Now we encountered the notion of entrainment when we were discussing locomotion. And I can demonstrate it. Here's one leg and this leg is capable of all sorts of things, doing all sorts of wonderful things on its own. And here's another leg. It's also capable of doing wonderful things on its own. They're two different things capable of different sets of things. But when I walk, they become non-independent. Then the position of one provides you with information about the position of the other. In the repeating cycle of the walk, they've become entrained one to the other. We saw the same thing with the wagging hands or wagging fingers of Scott Kelso's work. Here's a hand that can do all sorts of wonderful things. Here's another hand that's completely independent of the first. But in the context of the task of wagging your hands, your fingers at the same rate, they become entrained so that only these two patterns are possible, the in-phase pattern and the anti-phase pattern. Now, based on the results of the midterm, there's some confusion there, uh, so we'll try and clarify that a little bit more. But this notion of entrainment now is going to do work for us in a different realm. It's going to provide a means of understanding how our endogenous rhythms interact with exogenous or external rhythms so that we become hooked into the world. Let's just revise this notion. Now we're pulling back. Um, we want a definition of entrainment that's going to work for the legs when walking, the hands when wagging, but also for our sleeping and waking cycles and lots of other things too. So, let's define things carefully. If we have two distinct systems, leg one, leg two, hand one, hand two, and the two systems interact so that they exert a mutual influence on one another, and the resulting collective behavior is simpler in some fashion than merely the addition of one and the other, then we say they become entrained. So, when my hands become non-independent, when my legs become non-independent, that's a simplification. When I describe one leg, I've given you information about the other leg. Some examples, maybe. Two people dancing. Let's take two people dancing a tango, a wonderfully, highly coordinated activity. The man and the woman are doing slightly different things, but they are definitely non-independent of each other. They are crucially linked to each other and reciprocally interested influencing each other at all points and times. So that when they're dancing a tango, they have become entrained. Now the man and the woman can stop dancing a tango and can become completely independent of one another again. But in the time that they're dancing the tango, in the context of the tango, they are effectively a single unit. There's no point in considering what's going on in a tango as person one and person two separate. Likewise, if you come to consider what a handshake is, there's no point in understanding a handshake as being what this hand is doing as if it was separate from what this hand is doing. They become reciprocally linked in a handshake. A mother pushing her child on a swing illustrates something. Here we've got different roles. The swing is going backwards and forwards, and most of the time the mother and the swing are not interacting. But as the child comes up towards the top of the swing, the mother administers a push. 
Now that push has to be sensitively timed, it has to be done at exactly the right moment, there has to be a coordinative relationship between the mother and the child on the swing in order for this to work. And in this way, their movements become non-independent. Finally, we can get out of the realm of biology and living systems and human systems altogether and look at the way the moon goes around the Earth. Now the moon is also spinning around its own axis. But there's a very close relationship so that the moon always presents the same face towards the Earth because this period of rotation around its own axis has become entrained with its period of rotation around the Earth. So we find this notion of entrainment when oscillating systems interact. And it's not confined to biological systems. It's a very generic property of interacting cyclical systems. We'll start with an example of a life cycle. There's a good cyclical system. Something is born and then it dies. The 17-year cicada has a peculiar life cycle. It spends about 16 and a half years underground. And then, towards the end of its life, when it hasn't really done anything, it comes out of the ground and spends a couple of months in which it will eat, reproduce, and die. What do you think its experience of time is like? I, it's nothing like your experience of time. That's much we can say. I have no idea what its experience of time is like, but 16 and a half years just sitting, vegetating on the ground, and then coming out and doing everything in a couple of weeks, and then dying. Bizarre. Now, every year, some, site, some of these cicadas come out, but there's a big pulse there, synchronize themselves, so that every 17 years, there's a huge increase. If you live in the area, Midwestern United States, Indiana, and associated counties, uh, states, every 17 years, there's this abominable summer where these things come out and they make a noise like a bunch of chainsaws. It's horrible. 17 year cicadas are remarkable. There are other cicadas that have a 13 year life cycle. And there are ones with an 11 year life cycle, but there are no cicadas with a 15 year life cycle and no cicadas with a 9 year life cycle. Why? No 9 year cicadas. No 15-year cicadas, but we get 11-year cicadas, 13-year cicadas, and 17-year cicadas. Come on, mathematicians. Prime numbers, right. These are prime numbers. What's a prime number? A prime number has no factors other than itself and one. If we had 15-year cicadas, then an animal that had a predator that had a life cycle of three years or five years or 15 years, any of those would suffice to exploit the cyclicity in the 15-year cicadas life cycle and ensure that they were eaten most effectively. If you have a prime number of years, then you reduce the number of possible opportunities for entrainment between a predator life cycle and the prey life cycle. That's probably why we find these prime number of years. So much for that. Let's go on to the annual cycle. Here's a ground squirrel. This is an animal which, in the wild, will hibernate every year, spend a couple of months in a torpid state, slumber. And furthermore, they'll all go into the hibernation around the same time, and they'll all come out of hibernation around the same time. Now you could see that as being simply a response to the passage of the seasons. But we can see that there's an endogenous component as well. If it was, a if it was just the passage of seasons causing the hibernation, that would be an exogenous influence. But if it, there was an experiment done here where ground squirrels, five individuals, were kept isolated in an artificial environment in which there was no information about the passage of the seasons. So there's a constant temperature, 3 degrees centigrade. It'd be cold for me. They seem to do all right in it. A constant lighting, so no change from short days to long days. And what we found is that under these circumstances where all possible cues to the annual cycle that have been removed from the environment, they still hibernate. And you can see the blue bars here, which are the period of hibernation in four successive years. They all start off in the first year going into hibernation around the same time. But then, as you can see, as the years progress, they become progressively desynchronized. These are isolated individuals. 
So what you can see is that in the absence of any external signal, these animals have an endogenous cycle, annual cycle, but they all have slightly different ones. And as this, in the absence of the stabilizing effect of the external signals, they become desynchronized. So one has a shorter internal clock and one has a longer internal clock. So when, they, when they're in the wild, these internal processes are still going on, but everyone's receiving the same feedback signals from the environment. And that allows them then to synchronize, so they all go into hibernation and come out of hibernation at around the same time. So we've seen entrainment at the realm of many years in life cycles, and entrainment here with the passage of the seasons in a single individual. What about the month? Well, poets love, oh sorry, the poets love the moon, right? And the moon's effect on people has often been overstated. Is anybody here a werewolf? Good. I've got to watch my language in case there was... Here you are, sorry. Okay. Well, don't, please don't take offense. D.H. Lawrence, very poetic character, said that the moon that pulls the tide... He was right about that. The moon that controls the menstrual periods of women... Let's come back to that one. And the moon that touches the lunatics... Uh -uh. She is not the mere dead lump of the astronomist. Yes. Moon is very poetic. Is this the same moon that shines down on... Susie in Kentucky. <gasps> well, let's have a look at that. That should be around the menstrual periods of women. Let's have a look at that. There is a long-held belief that women's cycles, which are all about 28 days, although there's a huge amount of variation from one individual to the next, <coughs> that when women are in close contact with each other daily, that those cycles will become entrained or synchronized. This happens in convents and in boarding schools. So the story goes. Is it true? Well, first of all, we need some means for the synchronization. In the case of the synchronization with the passage of the seasons, we've got enough signal there in the light, for example, but there's no light signal for our menstruation. Um, so the suggestion was that this was chemical in nature and that people were entraining through pheromones, small chemicals of which they weren't aware that were causing these cycles to come into lockstep. That's the story that's out there, and it's been a matter of belief for a long time, and has rarely been subjected to empirical tests. There has been some interest in this recently. In fact, we can see temporal embedding in the world as a, a topic of growing concern within cognitive science generally, and ongoing research suggests that this is probably not the case. Sorry to burst your bubble, but it's probably not the case that women's menstrual cycles entrain by pheromones when they live in close proximity together. They may become more aware of each other's cycles, and there may be, there may be some kind of uh, misinterpretation or overinterpretation. We don't know. It's, the case is not settled. There's a lot of uncertainty here. It's, we're an area of active research, but the answer is probably not that these uh, cycles are entrained by pheromones. But if the lunar cycle and the monthly cycle are, are um, something of, are less efficacious, here's one period that really affects us all, the 24-hour day and night cycle, where we live on a planet that goes, that spins on its axis once every 24 hours, so we've always been exposed to nights and days. Now, you go to sleep Let's suppose you go to you were sensible enough to go to sleep when it gets dark and get up when it gets bright. Yeah, right. Uh, well, we live slightly different lives than that. But generally, this period of night and dark has been around for a long period of time, and it does affect our activity. In general, activity gets much less when it's dark, and it increases again when it's light. And you could see our going to bed activity as bearing a, only a sort of an indirect relationship to this. Um, certainly, the Turning off the lights outside, the, the sun setting doesn't force us to go to bed. We can stay up late. Uh, what we find when we study this, though, is that we are tied to this passage of light and dark in interesting ways. And once more, what we find is that there's some internal processes, endogenous processes, that have a cycle of about, actually about 25 hours. And we've got these external periodic processes of about 24 hours, and they're interacting, so that we become enslaved, entrapped, entrained, perhaps, to put it less dramatically. 
by the passage of night and day. This has been studied very extensively, and we know a lot about the mechanisms involved. There's a small little part of the nervous system just below the brain called the suprachiasmatic nucleus. There's chemicals produced there, and they are sensitive to light and dark, sunlight in particular, to the frequency spectrum of sunlight. Artificial light is not nearly as effective. And it's the presence of light that entrains this internal process to the external passage of time. You can already draw probably the only practical lesson you'll learn from this module, which is how to get over jet lag. You'll find lots of instruction out there on the internet. You'll be told to avoid caffeine and drink plenty of water and so on. And that's all fine and good. The one thing that works is exposure to sunlight. Expose yourself. When you, if you fly to LA, you fly to Adelaide, get out, expose yourself to sunlight. That's by far the most effective way of resetting your clock. We know the mechanism. We know we got science behind this. The way to get over jet lag is to re-establish a coherent relationship between your endogenous rhythms and these exogenous rhythms, which have become disconnected. Now, there's been lots of experiments done here um, with people presented with artificial environments. So a human circadian rhythm can be entrained to a 23-hour day, for example, not just 24-hour day. We can put someone in, some, in an artificial environment with 11 and a half hours of something like sunlight and 11 and a half hours of dark, and you'll be fine. You can adopt, you can get into a regular sleeping rhythm. But if we push that too far, if we get down to a 10-hour light and 10-hour dark day, that's a 20-hour day total, you don't set, settle into a stable sleeping rhythm again. You have periods of wakefulness, insomnia, unable. It's like being in a constant state of jet lag. So you can push this a bit, but you can't push it uh, in, in arbitrary amounts. We can do this with uh, hamsters really easy, and we find that hamsters' circadian rhythms are much more flexible than humans. Hamsters, and we can check to see, you know, are they establishing their normal sleeping and periods of activity and so on. They can be entrained to a day which lasts anything from 18 hours to 26 hours. Humans, not so much. There have been very occasional voluntary experiments where humans shut themselves off from all external cues. You basically have to go live in a cave for this. Cut yourself off from clocks, radios, TVs any information about the passage of time. And under those circumstances, your circadian clock inside you is running freely without any input from the world. And in one case, a subject who was in a cave-like environment for 58 days was trying to estimate how much time had passed. And they estimated that only 33 days had passed, so wildly off. What this shows is that the internal clock is slower than the external clock, so that the subjective experience of a day is actually longer than a natural day under these weird and pathological conditions. So we've seen entrainment of life cycles. We've seen entrainment at the year level, not so much at the month level. We've seen entrainment at the daily level. We see entrainment throughout nature. We see it in many other species, and we see some interesting examples here, there are some species of fireflies, because a reference, you can see this on video there, I haven't been able to find the video, but fireflies are really cute bugs. Um, you find them in lots of parts of the world, and as it gets dark, they start to flash. They're little flies that hover in the air, and they're kind of nice and stupid, and you can go over and almost pick them up. They don't run away. Uh, you collect them in jars. And they flash randomly, but there are two, at least two species where this random flashing becomes organized. One of these is found in Texas and Louisiana, and one of them is found in the swamps of Southeast Asia. And what happens here with these two particular species is as it gets dark, initially the flashing is random, but then with, if there's enough fireflies in one area, they suddenly synchronize and they go on and off together. There's no leader, but they all just hook up together and look like a Christmas tree then flashing on and off. A magnificent sight. I'd love to see it. It's an example of entrainment between them. It's all reciprocal, one influencing the other and being, in turn, influenced by it. There's a lovely example of this from fiddler crabs. These are crabs where the male has a great big extra appendage. His, 
where his right claw is huge. And the mating ritual, or the process by which a mate is found in the fiddler crab, is kind of humorous. The female comes out of her burrow, sits there, and the males assemble around her, and each of them engages in a waving activity with its big claw, kind of saying, hey baby, look over here. And they're arranged around, and each one is trying to be an individual. Of course, that's what it is to compete for mating rights. And so each of them is going, hey, look at me. Not at him, look at me. And the result, because each of them is doing the same thing, is they end up in perfect synchrony. So you end up with this semicircle of suitors all waving their claws in perfect synchrony. How the female chooses, I have no idea. It's bizarre. There's a lot of controversy about the effect of the uh, changes in the season that are wrought on people. We here in Ireland have medium long evenings in the winter, and we've relatively short days. If you live in Lapland, there are times of the year where you've no sunlight at all. And some people are very susceptible to depression under these circumstances. Whether this should be regarded as a medical condition, <coughs> it has a name, seasonal affective disorder. Sad. Right, you get it. And it can be treated, it's treated with light to try to simulate the effects of spring. But it's very controversial whether it really exists as a medical condition and whether the treatment is effective. Some people believe it does. Anyway. It's important to realize that our, we function at our best when things are in harmony with one another, when we're hooked in to the passage of night and day and the passage of the seasons um, optimally. It's interesting that the people we entrust with making the most important decisions in the world, the politicians and big people of business and so on, that make all these really huge decisions, they're jetting around the world all the time, which means they're in a constant state of jet lag, which is a state of disorientation. Nobody functions well under jet lag. Now, some people suffer from it more than others, but I wonder, is it wise to ignore this, the importance of being hooked into the passage of day and night like this. There are anecdotal ex examples of airline pilots falling asleep. Um, shift workers are in a kind of in a constant state of jet lag because they're forced to work uh, sustained periods of activity that are not well aligned with the passage of the day. Um, there's one documented instance of the entire crew of a plane falling asleep and waking up 160 kilometers further out in the Pacific. No one was hurt in that instance, but the two worst industrial disasters ever, Bhopal and Chernobyl, and if you're not familiar with them, look them up. They both happened through human error on the night shift. So we ignore this at our peril. We function best when we are well aligned with the world, and if we force practices on people that destroy that alignment, we do influence their performance. Now, up to now, I've used this word rhythm to describe anything that repeats, anything that's cyclic. But there's more to rhythm than mere repetition. If you confront a musician with a metronome, the metronome is perfectly periodic. Click, 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 click. But it's perfectly amusical. There's no music in that. Music begins when you start to play with that, when you create things out of that. There's another way of looking at rhythm, which de-emphasizes this role of periodic clocks and emphasizes instead its capacity for binding us together through the processes of entrainment. And we've met this contrast between coordination and control before. What we're doing is we're, we're, lo we're turning now to, a, to, un to look at coordination as a phenomenon in its own right again. Many people here have ever been to a silent disco. Get out of the house more, you folk. Silent disco is great fun. Right, you go to a silent disco, it's not silent. Popular at festivals. Everyone gets Bluetooth-enabled headphones. And there's two channels, channel A and channel B. And there's two DJs, and they're playing different songs at different tempi, a fast one and a slow one. And you can choose which you're, you're going to listen to. So from the outside, we can't hear the music. We hear people shouting a lot. And you look at people, and it seems kind of bizarre, but there's a, a sort of a... a, 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 a organizational method in this madness, which we can see if we consider what the role of these songs is. 
So if the red dots and the blue dots there were to index people listening to the first DJ or the second DJ, spatially they're all mixed up, so we get this great big confusing mess. But if we were just to look at the red dots in time, the people listening to DJ A, they'd all be moving together, they'd all be synchronized, and so they would constitute an emergent unity. All the people moving to DJ B are also all synchronized, so they constitute another kind of a unity. And although they're all mixed up in space, they're coordinated in time. That's what brings them out together. It's astonishing to look at. It. UCD Students Union about 10, 12 years ago held a silent disco in the button factory. I went in there and filmed some people, asked, could I do this, filmed some people, and um, used to show it because a still picture doesn't really convey this. And then sure enough, one time in lecture, after lecture, one of the students went out and called up her friend and said, you should have seen what he said in lecture, you were there! And I got an irate mother on the phone the next day saying, how dare you use my daughter in your lecture? She wasn't even in the bleeding lecture, she was on the beach somewhere on holidays. But I got nailed for it, so I'm not allowed to show you that video. So there's a really boring static picture of something which you can only really appreciate in movement. And we humans, we like to move. When you play us a song, we tap along with it. And it's interesting that our great ape cousins, the gorillas and bonobos and chimpanzees and orangutans, they don't do that. They're not interested in music. And they don't really spontaneously tap along with it or move along with it. And this has given rise to a rather interesting and fun area of cognitive science. It, some people have argued that this is a uniquely human behavior. And when you argue that, all kinds of bells go off. Hang on, language, reason, these were the things that set us apart from the brute beast. Now you're saying that tapping along with music is also one of these things? Well, maybe, maybe not, maybe not. So we've got this niche area now where we're exploring which animals can be entrained to music. And the original story was that it's only humans, because the apes don't do it. But we've learned a lot in this class. We've learned not to trust that. So let's have a look at some, first of all, some of the more recent stuff, which has been done on sea lions and seals and such like. And these animals have to be bribed to move along with music. Uh, do we have sound? Better make sure we have sound. Because we need it, we're going to look at a sea lion dancing for fish. <laughs> 130 beats per minute. <laughs> And it goes on. I'm not going to bore you. This sea lion's doing pretty good. What you're not seeing are the bribes, though. This sea lion has to be fed fish all the time. And this is not a spontaneous sea lion behavior. This is just like a wily sea lion who knows how to get some fish. The first well-documented instance of an animal who would spontaneously dance along with music came from a YouTube video. <coughs> Does anybody remember Snowball the Cockatoo? I see one or two people nodding. The life of an internet meme is really short these days. But Snowball was one of the first, was the first time that this came to the attention of scientists. So this was an internet meme. Snowball was filmed dancing and it was very funny. But a researcher, Annie Patel, over in California, like everyone else, saw this internet meme and went, wow, that's pretty cool. Hang on, that's really important. So he hunted Snowball down and he found him in an animal shelter in Indiana, where Snowball was happily dancing to the Backst Backstreet Boys, I think, uh, still. And he filmed him, and again, he played him music at various tempi, and verified whether the bird was simply moving periodically, or was the bird actually entraining to the music. And this made a wonderful and quite well-regarded paper in the <laughs> biggest journal in the world, Nature. So you have a look yourselves and see whether you're happy that Snowball is in training for the music first at 130 beats per minute.
So, Snowball does not have to be bribed to do this. Snowball does this voluntarily. This sparked a big discussion as to whether the fact that Snowball is also a, a vocal learner, because there's been now a few dancing parrots, would you believe, and they're all vocal learners. So the suggestion was, well, hang on, maybe this language and this entrainment thing is restricted to animals who are vocal learners, and that's why you saw the sea lion, because they're not vocal learners, but they have to be bribed. So it's a bizarre world of wonderful research, and I can't recommend it highly enough. Okay, that wraps up the topic.